Hello. Hi. Hi, Paula. Good to see you. Good to see you. And Tiana. <laughs> How have you been, Paula? I'm good. How are you? Good. So I guess we can honestly get started. We can just jump right into it because I feel like Paula, you've been with us on a couple of these now. Yes. Um, and if anyone else joins, we can give them the kind of like housekeeping notes. So with us this evening, we have Alex, and forgive me if I, I want to pronounce it, it's Kuick, correct? Kuick, yeah, you're right. All right, Alexander <laughs> Kuick is a partner at Brown Immigration Law where he oversees the firm's litigation practice, focusing largely on the removal and deportation defense in immigration courts throughout the United States. He's also an adjunct professor at Case Western School of Law, where he teaches asylum and refugee law, and he supervises the school's immigration. Um, and so tonight we're going to be discussing the film Identifying Features. Um, and just, you know, to remind everyone, it kind of covered uh, the intersection of Magdalena, who has lost contact with her son, who has uh, gone off to try to cross the US-Mexico and Mexican border, um, and a young man, Miguel, who is returning to the area after being deported um, after a time in the United States and kind of uh, uh, intersection. And I, would, I don't want to call it a friendship, but a relation, a relationship occurs or takes place or forms, if you will. Um, and so, Alexander, uh, did you want to kick it off with maybe one of your biggest takeaways of the film? Yeah. Is this our entire group? Just the four of us today? Well, for now. Yeah. Hopefully, like, for some now. other people will trinkle in. Um, that was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, we were kind of talking, I guess, before we started the recording. It was th that ending, right? I mean, it was, I guess... Movie wise, I wasn't expecting that ending at all. Um, but you know, I think the one you know the one thing actually I was thinking about um, with respect to the ending itself is kind of you know at, you know mom finds out about the son's situation and then like in the next scene over where the movie's wrapping up, she is essentially verifying that he's deceased, right? Which is interesting if you think about it because you know you you know your son is now part of this cartel killing folks and you're so she's still protecting her. Mm -hmm. protecting him rather right and the mom's still protecting her son even though she knows what's going on and kind of behind the scenes and is that a question of like is that motherly love or is that hey mom he i you know mom i promised you i'm going to send you money <laughs> it's better for me to be, to be presumed dead because you're impoverished right and you know she's in a situation i think one part of the scene where they said she doesn't have a telephone mm -hmm. right you know yeah. is it better to have that money kind of trickling in is that why she's doing it or is she doing it to protect her kid or i thought Oh, I also thought of it as like when they say like he has no identifying features, like maybe she just like I don't I don't know this person anymore. Right. Maybe yeah, that's what we're looking at it too, right? You know, so I looked at it, I looked at it more as like I need money. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend yeah, like my kid's right. dead and you know. Cause she, yeah, because I that's how I kind of took it as like maybe she's just like, you know, here's this, you know, this kid and no identifying features, just nothing that's of him that she would have would know. And so at this point, because she had went through so much to try to track him down and try to find him, and she looked so defeated. So that's kind of how I interpreted the ending. Yeah. Like, there's no identifying features, meaning, you know, there's nothing of him that's left over because obviously he's been taken over by the um, the cartel. Right. Yeah. So you looked at the, you looked at the humanitarian side. I did. I looked at the evil. I looked at the evil money side of it, thinking like. I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean that that. That take them the ending was not expecting it at all. I mean, I think we were kind of talking before. I was expecting like a, you know him walking through the streets of Chicago illegally crossing the United States, like you know countless other people, and maybe yeah. reconnecting with mom or something. But yeah, I was looking for like I thought that he was gonna like like that she was gonna do all that work just to find out that he did that he did die. Well, I guess he did in a way, but like that he was dead and that like, you know, all that was for all for not and that he's forever lost. But like, I just didn't expect that, you know, um, that he would have joined the cartel. And so I'm curious that how common or is that something that's like kind of realistically that happens? Yeah, I mean, so 
you know, in Mexico and really in Central America, probably more is, you know, you had these gangs, these like Maras, you know, MS-13, MS-18, you hear about on the news all the time coming up here and you have these cartels, right? And they've influenced like government and they influence like the law enforcement down there. And, you, you know, there are, and, you know, Mexico, they try to combat them, but they're so, they have some, you know, they have just as good armored vehicles and, you know, weapons as the police do. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's, you know, if you're from an area that's impoverished and you need to kind of get out quick, they're essentially kind of selling your soul to the devil, right? Which is kind of the whole image they kept showing during the fire part of it. Oh. You're 14, 15 years old and your family has no money and you're struggling and this is the way out, right? It's kind of like, I mean, you hate to say, it, but it's kind of like how we do with gangs in the United States, the way it's, you know, it's trying to be a, trying a quick way out and it never works out that way. You don't, it's just, it's just kind of this cycle of violence that just keeps kind of rotating over and over and over again. And in Mexico, it's, it's, it's huge. You know, it's the cartels control, you know, there's I think four or five major cartels out there. They're in a war in between themselves within the borders. The government's fighting them. So it's, you know, this kind of lawlessness where, you know, the, the funny, funny thing he was talking about with people in Mexico is you know, people think Mexico is like Cancun. I go to Mexico for the weekend, you know, I go to Mexico on a, you know, on a all-inclusive resort. Yeah, you might. And that little kind of, pocket of the yucatan peninsula but the part of the country is really really bad and dangerous you know and so how common is it i mean i guess you know i, I and you, you know up here in ohio we don't deal with the kind of the border stuff as much we have a lot of clients from up here they file for asylum and things like that we see it more i think from the central american side salvadorans guatemalans Hondurans, more you do in mexico um but yeah I mean, obviously it's prevalent in mexico I mean, it's a huge problem down there mm. Paula, do you have any thoughts on the indie? So I I never thought of it the way you did. So I'm grateful to hear your <laughs> your comments. I feel I'll tell you, these these movie conversations and just seeing the movies have been so enlightening to me. As I said before, it's just expanded my world. And just with this, I feel like. I've lived under a rock. Now I've seen other things that people haven't seen. So, you know, I might have my own movie about different parts of life, but I, I wasn't surprised that she said he was dead. I, or, or wrote, wrote that he was dead. He confirmed, she confirmed it. I thought she was protecting him. And I really appreciate you saying, well, there was really nothing left of him that she identified with or that was the son she knew. And I think the other strong point for me is he killed the person that she had come to like and who had helped her on her journey to discover her son. And so I wonder how much that influenced her. Um, I, I wondered a lot of the same questions that you asked of how often do these things happen? The fact that it even happens as portrayed. I mean, I fortunately, I haven't been exposed to that kind of killing and brutality in my life, but it was so intense. The movie was just so intense. Absolutely. Hi, Denise, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Sorry for being a little bit late. Oh my gosh, you're um, fine. Um, so we're just having a free flow of conversation about um, identifying features. Feel free to chime in, answer questions. It's not very kind of like a formal program. Um, we have Professor Alexander Kuzik here with us who um, has a background in immigration law. So this is kind of just helping us out with some kind of um, point of reference, but it's completely casual. Feel free to give your own perspective and feedback. And we're talking about the ending of the movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it was the most surprising and everybody's kind of sharing their thoughts. Did you have any, Denise? I, I was surprised by the, the end. Everyone has watched it, right? So it's not yeah, a spoiler. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was surprised that the son was still alive. Although I, I thought we're not going to have a movie if the son's not still alive, but that he actually was a bad guy now was was really disheartening for me. 
And uh, as is it is it Paula? Are you the yes, person sir. who just spoke? Okay. Yes. Um, I did. Hi. Not like not only did her bio son kill the, the the man that was helping her, but I was seeing him as like her substitute son once they connected. So mm -hmm. it's it's like he killed his brother. He killed her other son. Is is how I was feeling about it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed like maybe she was just, I don't want to say starting, maybe getting a, a sense of optimism to try to cope with the loss. Maybe, you know, having met Miguel, um, kind of being able to accept that her son was gone. And then it, it's kind of like she lost, like you said, like two children at once or, you know, you know, lost her son all over again in a way um, after not knowing. And, and I also wanted to just confirm like at the end when like it flashed back to them around the fire and everything her son had killed the, the friend's son correct that was the friend okay his um, own friend like yeah, his friend, friend. yeah okay yeah and th that's what I was thinking and so I I think that part really surprised me as well you know like he's in the militia and everything like that but to go back you know full circle to the beginning where you know you see Chuya you know grieving over her son and you know thinking and they're thinking you know something someone outside attacked them and you know the you know they were victims together and just to find out that he was the perpetrator the whole time I I, I kind of you know felt bamboozled there I was kind of like wow I uh I was really holding out hope there for you like you said he, Denise, he ended up being one of the bad guys I think kind of raised the question then like what do you do in that situation though, right? You know, like, mm -hmm. I think you know, before we start recording, another thing we kind of brought up was like, I, I deal a lot with immigration court in where somebody, let's say there's a civil war going on and the military rolls through your village or your town and they tell you, you know, men of fighting age, we're going to kill your wife and kids unless you go join the military. And you do, right? And that military commits atrocities and maybe you do stuff too, I mean, whatever it is. And you come to the United States and 20, 30 years later, they try to deport you because of stuff you did then to save your family, right? And immigration law is unique. We don't have like a duress exception. You know, you do it very, like you do it, you get deported. That's kind of how it works. And in this situation here, you know, he's in, he's what, you know, on a bus with his buddy driving up to the border. The cartel pulls it over. They start you know, robbing everybody. And they're like, hey, you want to survive? Who's going to kill somebody to survive? Right? Do you survive or do you just want to die like everyone else? Mm -hmm. You know? Right. And that was, I even thought that was a big, it was a leap of faith by um, the the son whose name I don't remember, that like the legit son. Jesus, I think was his name, right? Okay. Jesus. Yeah. He basically had the choice of kill or be killed and was trusting the, 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 the cartel guys that they wouldn't turn around and kill him anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He could have murdered his buddy and then they could have killed him. He would have died a murderer. Yeah. But. It was really tough. So I've had a little bit of ex exposure around immigration, like through the church I attend. And I did a, um, a, a brief less than one week trip down to the um, Arizona border through a program called Border Links, where we got exposed to a lot, including immigration court. And up until the pandemic, I was involved in court monitoring with a group from Cleveland who oh. is trying to keep honest the immigration court judges by being present in the courtroom. No. And I've done like some reading <laughs> and stuff. And it, it's just, it, it's so emotionally draining just to fictionally to watch something, but to hear and see some of the actual stories is just, it's exhausting. And, and th that's just, observing it not living it every day right so okay. alexander as someone oh i'm sorry go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tiana. <laughs> i was i was just going to say like you know someone who like works in immigration law and like works with, with different people who are going through you know these kind of situations like how or is there like a, a way that you could prepare them for anything are there like is, I know each case is you know going to be different and um, have its own nuances and you know aspects to it but is there anything that you could do to kind of prepare your clients overall to to deal with that process yeah I mean I guess in terms of you know, immigration courts very you know if you're going through the immigration court process right it's very black and white like it's Denise kind of kind of watch right you're, you get the porter you stay there's no like plea deals or you know settlements like you have in the real world 
it's either you get deported or you stay, right? Um, you know, I, I train most of the attorneys in our office too here. And I always kind of say it, being like brutally honest and kind of being like, hey, chances of success aren't very high, right? Because I think, the, the, you know, you know, the one thing at least I, I teach you at Case Western, the first week of every semester, I always teach ethics because in immigration law, it's the the biggest area of law that I can think of where people get abused ethically because think about it. Think about, you know, you're from, I don't know, you're from El Salvador or you're from, you know, Guatemala and you speak Quiche. You come to the United States, you don't know anybody, you don't know anything. And somebody's like, hey, I'll get you a work card. I'll get you this, I'll get you this, pay me this money, pay me this money. And they take the money and they go, right? Or they do they, they do frivolous filings and things like that. Um, it's hard, right? And it's you see this all the time where it's just like people being... You know, the notario frauds it's called these people just come in and they just they come in through town they round up 20 30 clients they charge them a bunch of money they skip town and go and but you know in certain cultures a, a, like a notary like we have a regular notary here in the united states they're deemed as like really really ethical and very educated and you know they don't rip people off here anyone get a notary stamp you just take the test study for it pay like the 20 yeah, bucks I'm a notary. yeah right <laughs> yeah and then and, and that's kind of how the system works right and so you know, how do you prepare them? I, I, I mean, I always kind of say be brutally honest, right? Like, you know, a lot of these cases from Central America, Mexico, when they're filing for like asylum based on like gangs or cartels, those cases don't win. I mean, those are usually cases you just don't take. You're like, hey, you're wasting your money, go somewhere else. And you hate to say this to somebody, but the law is on, the law is essentially creates like a barrier to deny these cases. Now, is that to stop a floodgate of people coming in applying for it? Probably, they probably have something to do with it, right? But it's, it's, you know, it's just so, asylum is so person or kind of factual specific. And my country's in a general bad spot. That's not what asylum is. That's, that's like 60% of the world, right? I mean, this is how we hate you know, be, be, be brutally honest about it, but most of the world is not the United States. Mm. And so it's hard. I mean, it's, and we, we deal with it all the time. You know, I've, I got a case tomorrow where like, I talked to the mother today. I was like, we've, your kid's probably getting aborted, right? And you hate to say that to somebody, but like, it's easy to take their hopes up, you know, it's, it's hard. Like how many years you have, like a lot of times you talk like kids, like you're never going to see your dad again, unless you move overseas with them. That's hard. It's a hard conversation to have. Right. And it's different. You know, it's, I think criminal attorneys kind of go through it as well. Right. You know, Hey, someone might have to be incarcerated for a while. That's a hard discussion to have. Right. Nothing against like contract attorneys, but like a contract attorney, the hardest thing is like, Hey, we lose money. Right. I and mean, that's like the biggest, hardest conversation you have, but to tell like a husband, Hey, you're going to lose your wife or a kid you're gonna lose mom you know that, that's hard you know but it is and brutally and you know the one thing I, you know i think culturally like latin america central america they're very point blank like they, they accept it they get it right like you tell somebody and that's kind of you know one thing in kind of this movie there was a lot of emotion in this movie like when she, she was hearing stuff she was kind of like okay next like next step time to move on and that's because culturally how i'm not trying to paint them with a broad brush but culturally is how they are they're very accepting of you know, facts of life where the United States, you know, Americans were not like that at all. We want like every other option possible and are very, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I noticed watching that. She met with the police at the beginning, the two mothers, there's no emotion at all, you know? Hmm. I didn't know if they needed to be that way as a self-protection. Right. So, and it might be, it might be something culturally how they are, you know? As you say that, she also, when she went to hear the story after she went on the boat across the DM and heard the story, I don't recall seeing any emotion in her, but maybe there was, and I don't remember. You know, I, there was, I, going, going to that point, remember she like goes down like that hill and she's sitting on that river? Oh, yeah. There's that scene for like 20, it looks like she's like rubbing her eyes. I don't know if she's tired, but like that is kind of a far away shot. Yes. That's probably the only time you really see her show emotion the whole time. Yeah. Like, even her kid is there with a gun. I don't know. Like, would you like, would you hug your kid? I mean, what do you do? She's just kind of like, maybe she's more awestruck than anything. I don't know, but very mm. little emotion. Mm. A little bit on a different topic. I was amazed at her stamina. It is a movie, <laughs> but just how much she needed to travel and she she did it and she kept doing it. And she wasn't a young woman. And she did what she needed to do. 
I kind of also wondered if like, as part of the film, you're right, cause like she traveled a, a, like a ton, she did uh, lots of landscapes and imagery and scenery. So I wondered if they were also, you know, trying to like illustrate kind of like the journey that you mm. know would have to take um, in the process of trying to get, you know, to or from the border. Mm -hmm. Same with Miguel when he was being deported from the United States, kind of how like the camera was following him, you know, through the airport, you know, down the terminal, like they were just, you know, he, he, you know, had to take a, like a couple of, you know, a ride to get to where he needed to be and then continue on foot. So I wondered if like, you know, part of that was to, you know, really drive home that, you know, this is a journey, a trek, it's, you know, not something, you know, one takes lightly or can do easily. Mm -hmm. And she's from like, like Michoacan, which is like, maybe a third of the way down, <laughs> right? Like she's not like really far down the bottom. I mean, Mexico is a huge country. And so, right. you know, I think, I, I think that's kind of part of the point is to show like all these, you know, you're from Mexico, you're, she's from a third of the way close to the United States. Imagine you're from like Honduras. You got to go through other countries and all the way up through Mexico to get there. You know, it's, it's a huge journey. It is. It's a dangerous journey. I mean, it happens all the time where they, you know, these people get killed in the way they're all the time. I was, I think I was also kind of surprised, I mean, not surprised that people lose their lives in the journey, but that right. it was, you know, so casually, like a, like a part of this, you know, just any other day, like, you know, here's this book of just, you know, deceased and, and mutilated people to just, you know, just casually flip through. Um, and it was just, or, or even when, you know, she went to give the blood to test and everything, the nurse, you know, this was just like another day at the job for her. And it, it's like, you know, you, I, don't, I don't know how many people she's seen or dealt with and things like that to say how she should or should not, you know, be or react and everyone, you know, deals with trauma and, um, differently. But I just wasn't, you know, you when you hear cases or stories, you, you hear about like, they were deported or they, you know, came into the country illegally, but you really don't hear any in-betweens. And you certainly never hear stories like this from the people who are left behind perspective. And for that, like I, I thought the movie really opened up how I looked at the whole like process. It, it's not, you know, just a, a, a A or a B type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't I hadn't thought of that, that we're hearing not from the person who took the journey, but the person who was left behind, who has to cling to hope until there's, or even when there's not clear evidence to the contrary, that there's nothing to be hopeful about. Like the other mother, um, who was a, like a doctor or a medical person who also had to go and identify and, and refused to, right? Because she didn't see anything concrete. Did I interpret that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Where it seemed like it was pretty clear evidence, right? They had done DNA matching of her and her, mm -hmm. the fa and the, the son's father, but she still wouldn't sign saying that he was gone. Yeah. And I mean, she was a medical professional, right? And her kid did mm -hmm. it, right? So it's, not just like, you know, the farmer or the impoverished kind of, you know, folks living in the village or the town. She's a medical professional with a car and a cell phone and, you know, internet access and all those things. Oh, you muted, Kristen. Um, how does the deportation, can you kind of elaborate a little bit about the deportation process? Like, how does it vary from like adults to like kids? Like, how does that kind of... I, it depends on, I guess, where you're at in the immigration process and kind of where you're at in the country, too. And, you know, if you're coming at the border, they, you know, they have expedited deportation where they stop you at the border. They deport you right away. Um, they have, you know, obviously we have a huge influx right now going on, right? We have these children. I, I actually was reading the number today. I forgot the number. I want to say like 64,000. I don't know if that might seem high. There was a huge number of children who are kind of like in these facilities, you know, and under, you know, kind of going back under the Bush policy, it was, you know, mom and dad show up, 
we sep- we don't separate the kids, right? And then the Obama administration was like, well, we can't do that. Let's start building these huge facilities along the border. And that's what they started doing. Trump administration was like, let's start separating them, right? So if you're a kid, it's different because you're a child. You know, and sometimes they let kids in, they, they turn them over to HHS, Health and uh, Human Services, and they, they refer them out and find families for them. Um, if you're kind of on the interior of the border, right? So you come in as a green card or as a student or whatever it is, and you violate your whatever, whether it's a student visa or your work visa or your green card, commit a crime, whatever it is, that's kind of how the, the process starts. And then depending on why you're being deported, plays a role in what what you like relief you have and like how you could stay here, um, whether you get out on bond or not. I mean, we have, we just did this in my class last week. We have mandatory detention in immigration court where like possessing, I don't know, possessing a scale for marijuana use is mandatory detention. You cannot get a bond. It's a misdemeanor in Ohio where you can, you can theoretically be a drug trafficker and get a bond in Cuyahoga County. You might get a very high bond. You might get a $2 million bond, but that is, it's available to you. You get convicted of possessing a, a bong. You can't get out of jail in your entire immigration process. You fight it for five, six months to take. Right. You're, you know, under the Trump administration, they really, really increased the bond numbers. You know, Denise, you were there probably observing bonds, right? Like, I remember, when, I remember going a high bond in Cleveland was like $5,000. You're like, oh my God, $5,000. You got under the Trump administration, you got under 20 or mm-hmm. 16 or 17. You were lucky. If you're a single mom from Guatemala with three kids, you're not going to be able to pay $16,000. To get and out. it wasn't, am I right? You weren't going to a bail bondsman and putting down a percentage. No, 100%. Like you had to have the whole amount. 100%. It's got to be a certified bank check or a postal money order, right? So if you're again, if you're, and you know, and we had a couple of judges kind of come through Cleveland who were like, high bond, high bond, high bond, 25,000, 25,000, 20,000. And you're like, for a mom who got pulled over for like speeding in North Royalton, like, really, this is what we're doing. And that's kind of how the system was set up for a long period of time. Yeah, I remember, like, I remember Cleveland. We had Judge Evans, who you know he was our very, very tough judge. You know, like very strict and everything. I remember, like, he would give you five, six thousand. You're like, oh man, it's so high, right? You would kill for five, six thousand now, right? I mean, and so the system, it, you know, the one thing I, I wish there was a movie about the immigration court system. To be honest with you, it is such. I mean, Denise, you if you sat there and watched it. It's there's no right to counsel. There's no you know, you don't get, there's no publicly appointed counsel. There's no rules of evidence. You carry all the burden. The government really doesn't carry a burden at all. You know, and it's a, it's, a, the judges have a, a quota. They have to meet so many cases a year. It's just a big machine and it keeps cranking out cases. Right. When I was in Tucson in, in, watching immigration court there for one day, it, and they were operating under a program called Operation Streamline, which was basically like, get them out fast. Yeah. And I was timing, um, like the amount of time they would do a mass of eight people at once. Like, do you believe, do you believe, do you believe, do you believe, blah, 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 next, move on. And like, I averaged it out and it was, it was a really sad amount of time, like less than 90 seconds a person that their future was Mm -hmm. determined for them. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I was at a hearing last week. My client was, there was like somebody going before us and they're on video. So this person's down in Southern Ohio on a video and he's he was from nepal and he was going to file some type of application for like asylum to stay here and the judge is like you have to do what's called a fee and you have to file it get the receipt and all these things and the gentleman asked the judge how do i do that he's like and there's an interpreter they do provide you with an interpreter and he asked the judge how do i do this and the judge is like there's a set of instructions on the table in front of you follow he was like i don't speak english i don't read english and the judge is like hopefully someone speaks nepalese there like that's it. It's just like, what do you what do you say there? The judge is like, no, I gotta do. That's not you know. And the judge in the in the judge's defense, that's not his agency that has to do the filing. It's the government. It's Homeland Security. That you do it right, mm. right. And he says, it's it's an insane court system. And it is. And, you know, I, I remember reading what one of the judge you know one of the judges on the union said something one time. It's like running a, uh, a tr- it's like being funded with the speed of a traffic court, but you're doing like capital murder cases that's what it is it's high stake stuff and there's no i mean it's denise you've seen it. i mean you were in the cleveland court and you've seen the, in areas on the border it's it's just a big machine no matter what it, it gives a great appearance of some kind of due process but it's yeah, yeah. it's a shell yeah it. it is and it's, it's like i can't i mean and you know in the judge's defense and you know they're 
they're doing their job. The prosecutors are doing their job. They're, they're doing the, how the system's set up. And until the system changes itself, we, you know, no one's really to blame but the system at this point. And it's just, it's ballooned. You know, but to think that, like, there's no bond for people, is, that's always the craziest thing to me. It's, I wasn't I wasn't aware that it was there were such stark differences. Oh yeah. Um, because you know, I, in my mind, you know, you've been you know, you have citizenship or you have a green card or you know, it's you know, it's it's okay now type of, you know, but that's just kind of how far removed from the process I think like yeah. the general public is, you know. Whenever you hear about immigration in the news or, you know, society it's it's not really painted, you know, in a positive way. And it's right. certainly not, you know, explained, you know, and, and, you know, probably purposefully by the news, you know, of, you know, explained how the process work or who's in charge and who's, you know, really making these ultimate decisions. And, um, well, or like you said, that there is no duress, you know, which is, you know, crazy to me that, you know, I, I'm a child, I'm a, you know, a young man you know, or a young woman or whatever, and I've been, you know, made to do these terrible things at the cost of my life or my loved one's life and that's just oh well mm -hmm. and that's kind of the whole immigration process is like that like it's just, it's just you're a single mom of again single mom, i'm trying to say the single mom example over and over you're a single mom of three kids you've been here for five six years don't really have many options to stay in here oh well you know and a lot of times you'll say like what about the kids and the government's like they're american citizens they don't have to go anywhere and you know they're right legally they're right they're citizens they don't go anywhere but who's going to take care of that three-year-old and four-year-old you know some... i guess that's my next question then like speaking of like when people get say mom gets deported then like what happens to these children or like what do they just go into well that's up, that's up to the parent right i mean a lot of times they either go to the you know hopefully they have family that can take them in if not they go into the system wow. right which is just another vicious cycle that kind of keeps going right. you know? and, Mm -hmm. Right. And then it, sometimes they go back with mom and dad. You know, they go live overseas. And and logistically, what happens when someone is deported? So they're in a court and they're told they're deported. Yeah. So they're like detained, for instance. Right. Let's just say they have, you know, in Cleveland, let's say they have, they have a bunch of people from Honduras. Right. Essentially, what happens is once the judge signs a deportation order, the judge is done. They, they've washed their hands of this file goes back to homeland security and homeland security has ice which is the deportation arm of homeland security they have a group called ero it's enforcement removal operations their job is to get people deported right so they it's not high tech like they go and try to find the best ticket they can on like expedia.com whatever it is if it's a big country like honduras or guatemala they have a chartered flight you know like they used to be one like before kind of covid cleveland had one every tuesday they'd fly out full of folks going down south they'd land in houston and they'd separate them out and fly them home um you know and like like i guess on uh the joe miguel's one who was the guy he got deported yeah yeah he was on a border town right he i mean you saw it kind of the beginning he got convicted i guess federally for probably illegal reentry or illegal entry in the united states eventually once that happens they turn you over the immigration judge he's got no way of staying he gets deported and they just take you across the border open the border up, like all right goodbye that's kind of what they do right if certain other you know if you got to fly you know if you're going to i don't know molly right they have to they have to get like a passport they have to get a flight itinerary they have to actually book a flight to get them there but they you know i know a lot of the agents that do this and you know in the past and they're like we literally land there and like Good luck. He's walking through the airport. Are you saying that prior to COVID, once a week there was a plane of people being deported? Yeah, absolutely. And the agents <laughs> go with them? Yeah, well, it depends. Yeah, a lot of times overseas they go with and They don't go as much as they had in the last like four or five years. But before, they used to fly all the time. They would charter, you know, they'd go on a, whatever, a Boeing 747 on Lufthansa going to Germany and they'd fly out of Germany to them, make sure they get on their connecting flight. But, you know, ICE has its own airline. It's called ICE Air. They deport people all the time. I you know, they no charter idea. flights. I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, uh, the number of people that get deported is incredible, right? What and can you, like... How many? I mean, I don't know. I would think... Let's say from Cleveland in a certain time frame. Do you have any sense of I mean, Cleveland's responsible for all of Ohio. We have one court here. 
Oh, okay. Right, so we have one core in Ohio. You have five detention facilities. And this is, only, this is the only people who are detained. There are people who are out and about fighting their deportation cases who get ordered deported by a judge. And once they, okay. you know, they have an appellate process, once their appellate process is done, either, you know, I, 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 I always give ICE the benefit of the doubt on a lot of things. A lot of the, I always tell people, like, these guys don't wake up and they don't go, like, I'm going to rip this mom away from his kids. Like, they never do. I don't, I'm sure there are some, right? But, like, for the vast majority, they wake up and they're like, I have to go to work. This is horrible, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, everyone does. No one wants to go to work, right? Um, and so, you know, if you were somebody who was kind of out in, you know, you went to the immigration court system, you just lost. You lost your appellate process. You kind of lose. A lot of times, the, the agents will, if you have an attorney who they trust, like, hey, listen, Time's up. Tell your person to turn themselves in, or you know, have them report with a plane ticket. We're not going to arrest them. They can just fly and leave on their own. You know, they, they get one bag worth forty-four pounds of luggage, right? And that's kind of what they do. Um, you know, if you're a fugitive, they arrest you. They hold you until they get you a plane ticket and ship you out. How many people? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I would, I, I would say a low number is probably ten thousand in my head. I don't. I, this seems like a low number. Just think about the sheer number of people who come in who get caught all the time. You know, we have. And this is how the system is. And along the border, you know, you get people get deported four or five times a month. You know, they come in, they, they try it again, they get caught, they keep kind of, it happens. So if someone were going from Cleveland back to Mexico, would they fly to Mexico? Usually from the flights that I know, if they're detained, usually they go from like Cleveland, they usually go to like Oakdale, Louisiana. They'll stay there for like a couple of days. And then from there, they'll get shipped off to like Houston. And then from Houston, they'll send them to Guatemala City, San Salvador, Mexico, okay. where they send them. But a lot of them in Mexico, they just have a bus. They take them to the bus. Okay. They're like, all right, everyone get off the bus. Go back home. And then, huh. you know, I have down, Denise, I guess down in Arizona, that's what they did, right? It was more of like a bus, right? I, I didn't see what happened after. Yeah. Um, after their cases were decided, but they all came in like shackled to each other and they were taken out shackled to each yeah. other. And that's, that was our exposure. Mm. So then like when they get deported, it's it's kind of just a, like you're on your own. If someone, if someone is deported, are they eligible for re-entry to the United States in the future? Um, Possibly. Yeah, I mean, it's very circumstance specific. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times people who are deported, you know, like a common one, say someone from Mexico enters illegally, right? If you're here illegally for more than a year and you get deported, you cannot come back for 10 years. Yeah. Um, you can get that forgiven if you show like a hardship on your family, right? But that hardship is only a spouse or a parent. So your kids don't matter for that. But if you enter twice illegally, it's a 10 year banishment that cannot be forgiven. Hmm. certain crimes can be forgiven fraud can be forgiven a lot of things can be forgiven some things can never be forgiven and you know drug traffickers will never come back here um murderers child molesters they'll never come back here in a million years at least with a green card you know and so there's certain crimes and you know and it's very discretionary too hmm. you know there's people who, there are processes that we do where we tell people if you have to leave we're going to bring you back like, put your faith in me. You're going to go back. I gotta, I'll got. i bring you back within a year, hopefully. And we do it all the time, you know? I just had literally had a gentleman go back to El Salvador. And, and that process he was doing was usually like a two, three month process. He's still stuck down there because his interview was, I think like March 22nd of 2020 and COVID hit and embassy oh, shut down the day before he went. So his wife and kids have been waiting since March of last year, which had there not been COVID, he would he was he would have been back that, that Friday. That was his interview scheduled. Right. right. So things like that happen. But you know, a lot of times you tell people like, hey, you're gonna have to go back. I just had a guy come back from Indonesia on Monday last week. You know, he was gone for about three, four months. You know, and like and they come back, it's great. You know, hey, the, the plan worked and things worked, but there are some people who leave, like you know, you you tell the family they're never gonna come back. And you guys have to figure out as a family what do you do? That's a hard conversation to have. I hate to bring down the whole discussion. <laughs> I'm going to um, type in the chat a book I just finished reading. Um, it's a fictional book, but it was it was excellent. And I listened to audio versus reading it. And I even recommend that. But it's called American Dirt. I don't know if any of you have read it, but it, it was wonderful. So I'll put the author and title in the chat. Thank you so much for sharing.
I think another thing I was kind of surprised by was like when you hear about you know people trying to enter the United States as families or as adults or things like this like I didn't know that you know there might be you know ch you know kids you know getting together and and just trying to cross the border or you know anything like that and I you know part of me like reading about identifying features you know um after the fact was that I, I saw, I can't remember the name of the movie, but there was a, a film, like I saw the trailer of these boys who were making their way to, uh, on the tops of trains. And like, you know, how they had like lost friends and, you know, had, this was their third or fourth or fifth, however, I can't even remember how many attempts. And like, they just kept saying, we're gonna go again, we're gonna go again. Um, and it was, they, they could, I think the oldest one couldn't have been more than like 14. And the youngest probably like 10 or 11 and they were no no adults no they were just on their own just trying to make their way and i just thought that was that was bananas i mean the whole pro the whole process is bananas but the thought that you know just on their own these children are either taking the initiative or feel like you know they need to you know get better lives and are just doing it I, you know, I think part of it's kind of the political climate at that point in time they're coming, right? You know, right now, if a child comes or under the Obama administration, there was a possibility of coming in and then kind of going through a process and then going through health and human services. And then you had an uncle in Denver, Colorado, they would turn you over to your uncle, right? The family kind of knew this going in. Um, under the Trump administration, it didn't work out that way nearly as much, right? It was like, hey, go sit in Mexico and wait for your hearing or, you know, you're never coming in anyways. With this. And Right now, you have this huge influx coming in again, right? And is that because of the political climate? Is it the belief? Is it bad information? I don't know. I mean, I'm not down there, but you know, it's. I think it's kind of telling right now that there's a huge influx of children again coming in, and you know, it, it, it's sad to say these children will come in and they'll file for asylum. They're not going to win, right? I mean, these aren't winning cases, and again, the vicious cycle keeps going. That right? It's like you you get a kid, you get you know, and. They get deported and you know if you really look at kind of the history of all these gangs in central america they're all second generation of the, their parents were all deported during like the gang the gang kind of culture of the early 90s from california they took kind of like that blood script mentality went back to el salvador and honduras and then passed along their kids and now they're these huge you know gangs down in el salvador and that's kind of where they got we essentially created it by deporting them you know, that's what they're, how they are. That's how they, that's how they got the idea of it. Awesome. Anyone else have any like major takeaways or any more thoughts about the film, about the process, um, the kind of out, I think I'm kind of just kind of outdone by the way that this system is kind of set up to disregard like all humanity. It's kind of like they've just completely, sh I mean, criminal justice, I could talk about like my thoughts on the criminal justice system mm -hmm. as a whole, but uh, this process, you know, and, and especially when it comes to so many, you know, lives and so many different variables and things like that, I just feel like it's, it's a very just, across the board type of process there's no humanity there's no you know thoughts for that person's life or well-being or any or mentality or anything like that um and i feel like that's so very telling of our society and you know what what we prioritize and you know you know what and who we care about yeah i mean i think one thing you know kind of touching on the, the criminal justice part of it, at least, at least in a way, I mean, not strong enough, but at least there's like a voice out there for criminal justice, right? It might not nearly be strong enough by any stretch, but at least there's somebody there. And at least, mm -hmm. and usually I think people actually care about more because maybe it's, it's American citizens going through it, right? You know, like, do we need criminal justice reform? Yeah, like really bad, <laughs> right? But at least there's like somebody trying to do something. It's just a couple of people who care about it. Immigration reform, immig immig you know, you know I tell people all the time, immigration law hasn't changed since 1997. It's the exact same law since 97, right? It's just the different policies and different kind of how they do it. It's the same law from 90, and it got worse in 97. I mean, that's under the Clinton administration. They made it way worse. You know, it was bad in 1990. They passed a, an act that made it really bad. In 97, they literally destroyed all like 
you know, judicial right. review and all these things are in there you are 24 34 years later 24 years later, had a math 24 years later it's the exact same law we had before it's you know a lot of stuff like the trump administration was doing was just applying the law they were like this is what the law says what we're doing like that there was the whole thing about the public charge rule which was like whether or not trying to limit people's ability to get green cards based on income education age and health and things like that that's literally what the law says i mean this is what the law says in 1997 it's you know it's the section of law and it, 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 it how they applied it was obviously horrible it was like let's kind of demonize everyone by applying the law right but the law has been the same for so all this time right like the real reform is doesn't exist and what will it i don't know i mean i, I thought you know. this has been super enlightening because i think like you said there's not like we see the like the reaction we see the law apply but we don't under i did not understand that that's what the law says and Mm. that because to me then the issue is that the issue definitely is that you know families being separated but then the also issue is then how do we work to like change the laws and to change right. like what's happening or to work so that's where the advocacy kind of has to kind of come in if right. that be kind of correct on that yeah and there's people like yeah i would say like society I mean, i'm sure a vast a big chunk of people want to have some type of form yeah. yeah like really i think they do it's it's there's no like political power behind it like let's criminal justice reform at least some politicians care about it like i mean i'm not again a lot of them don't <laughs> but at least some care but like immigration law who really cares about it i mean like they say they do but like it's been 24 years you've done nothing right mm -hmm. i mean it's wow you know it's and it's kind of the interesting thing with like this debate about like those daca kids you know it's like dreamers like who cares if they get a green card they're here working anyways they're late i mean they, they got work cards I mean, who cares, right? Like about, and kind of going back to the initial topic about like the money thing. And like, if I was a government, I'd be like, here, pay me a lot of money, all of you get your green cards, right? Make money for the government, you know? But it's it's a political debate. So why do we want to help these kids out? Yeah. I don't know, why Why don't we, <laughs> right? I mean, remember like when Arizona made a big lawsuit when they had the DACA thing, not getting driver's licenses. I was like, you make 30 bucks a driver's license. Why would you want them not? giving you $30 every year for a driver's license, you know, but wow. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bizarre, it's a crazy system. You know, like, like our court is, it's not an independent court. Our judges work for the, the attorney general. Like they're, they just, they're employees of the attorney general's office. They, they're not independent judges. They're not allowed to make their own decisions. Really. They have to like, they have quotas and just bizarre systems. Mm. Denise, I saw you unmute yourself. Yeah, I I was gonna uh, <laughs> second crazy some system is? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was also gonna say like there's no time to talk about this, but you could have a whole other conversation about the private prison system and how that um, this helps feed feed that. Which I don't I don't want to get enraged. Um, but uh, one other um, more positive thought I had was that even although this was a difficult movie and a bad, you know, a really tough story. Like I still try to look for like the moments of grace during it. And there were a couple like people who helped her who didn't have to like going, going to the person who stood outside the bathroom st stall wall and said, you're doing it wrong. Here's what you need to do. And then along the way, she found a couple more people who were able to, to give her help and show her grace. So that, that gave me, you know, a little bit of hope for her. Those were positive moments. I, I, I just wanted her to, I just wanted it to end better, but it would not have been really realistic, I guess, if it had ended how I had hoped in my mind. Yeah, and I think that, so throughout this whole um, process with these different films that we've got a chance to see, um, a, I'm grateful because A, these are films that I probably ne necessarily would not have picked out for myself. But then also like, again, shines light on issues and telling the story of other people perspective that like, I'm just not, I think some of the policy, like I just, like I've lived and I have some experiences, but like not nearly what these other people have gone through. And like, um, I was saying this conversation has been so enlightening because there's just so much I just didn't really understand and kind of know about our immigration system and immigration law and kind of how it works in our country, even in the state of Ohio. I didn't even know Cleveland was a hub. Um, so 
um, I think that the, the, for me, that has been just a very enlightening and eye-opening for sure. Yeah, I mean, it is a hub, right? Like we're like the, it's for like, you know, USCIS, it's the main field office for this part of the country. It's the only core of this part in, in Ohio. It's like Denise was kind of saying earlier, there's these private jails. Ohio, you know, we have five jails, which are county jails who have contracts with Homeland Security to detain people, right? We literally, kind of going back to this point, we literally just had this discussion with my class last week. The average cost per inmate in the United States of ICE is $787 per person. And there are two big private jails. There's Core Civic and GEO Group. They're publicly traded stocks. I mean, you can buy stock in their jails. When, you know, and it's just a crazy system. It's nuts. But it's a system that doesn't get talked, spoken about, right? I mean, it's just kind of this... There was a, I, I had a student years ago, John Oliver, I know who he is. He's like, yeah. Yeah, Comedy Central or something? Yeah. I don't know. I did, but there's, some, there's, a, he, there's one where he talks about the immigration courts. And I remember like watching it. I mean, it was part of it was really funny. Part of it was kind of morbid that you're like, oh my God, we're making fun of this. But there's one, there's this one story that I remember reading about it. And he, he talked about it. there's one judge, I think in Virginia, there was like a four year old child representing themselves. And the judge said something to the kid. It was like, hey, it's not that hard to represent yourself in court. You have to go forward. You don't have an attorney. And it's like a four year old kid. Wow. And if you watch this John Oliver thing, he's kind of just goes on this tangent. He's like, it's a four year old kid. It's like, he, like, you know, like can't make his own breakfast, let alone represent himself in immigration court. Wow. You know, this is a crazy system. Yeah. You, know, you would never think in a million years a four year old kid would go to Cuyahoga County or from his own source. I mean, there's no way. No way. Yeah. Well, I think that like this has definitely been very helpful because, like I said, we know to kind of know where like our advocacy efforts need to kind of be. And I appreciate Denise sharing like the organization that you were working with because, like I said, I had like no clue that this is something and that the system was just this. Like broken. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like shattered. One of the it's like shattered. <laughs> it's been like decimated. Yeah. Like yeah, like I knew it was broken, but I didn't know it was like yeah. whoa. So that's yeah, crazy. You know, it's crazy for sure. Yeah, I've been like taking notes. I was like, oh, I need to like look. I was like ninety seven. What? That. Hmm? I. I mean, they. You know, they. I, I don't know. They they change a lot of laws, way more frequently, and I guess I just assume that that had changed i mean surely since 97 yeah but you know it's a federal law and it, it, it takes two parties to kind of tango and get it done it's never happened mm -hmm. and you know part of it's politically you know some whether you believe in it or not do you want to kind of put your your neck on the line to push a reform for people who aren't your citizens aren't your constituents where you come from an area where they're very anti-immigration and do you really want to do that but we'll see. Time will tell. I just wanted to mention one other thing. I did watch a little bit of um, an interview with the writers and directors. Oh. And the one of the things the two women said, they wanted to be, bring to the forefront the humanitarian crisis that was escalating in 2011 in Mexico. And Tiana, I don't know if it was you that mentioned how it wasn't just about migrants. Yeah, it was like about like like the family. Also, the middle class, or maybe oh, Alexander. You, Alexander. Someone mentioned that with the medical professional. That was one of the points they wanted to get across. That it wasn't. It <laughs> Pardon me. They said it worked. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. Yeah, I mean, it's and it's the thing, you know. I kind of go back. People don't think Mexico is a country that like it's like Jamaica or like Dominican Republic. People go there on vacations all the time. They're, you know, like Jamaica is like the worst country in the world to be like a homosexual in, like by far. And people don't think about it, right? And it's like people go there on vacation all the time. And you know, people go to Dominican Republic and it shares part of you know island with Haiti. I mean, it's it's crazy, but. You know, you have these little pockets of resorts that they think people think it's like these paradise. And it's like Mexico, right? You think Mexico is a paradise. And, you know, Mexico City and Guadalajara, the big cities are, you know, it's like any big city, right? But, like, there's certain parts of Mexico where, like, you look at El Chapo, right? I mean, he's, like, revered in that part of the, because he's like a Robin Hood, right? He was taken from the rich and given to the poor, right? He might remember killing people to doing that. He might have been a lot of drugs, but the local community was being helped, and they kind of overlooked it.
thank you everybody for joining. I'm sorry, I had like my, I have a, a teenage neighbor and he's decided he wanted to practice playing basketball right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought this was great. I thought, you know, echoing like Crystal and Paula, um, like this film festival has definitely given us the opportunity to expand our, I don't, it sounds super cliche, but expand our horizons and um, our perspectives and really put ourselves in a mindset that we normally would not, you know, go where we would normally not go. Um, and these conversations I feel like have been incredibly beneficial because um, we get everyone else's viewpoints as well and their experiences. Um, so this was the last of the film discussions of this film festival, but we certainly hope to do this again with new films in the future. But me and Crystal are already turning our little wheels. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much. This was excellent. And thank, thank you, you, Alexander. Yes. Thank, you, Alexander. thank you. I definitely want to bring you, Alexander. Yeah, definitely want to bring Alexander back for another discussion. Uh, on we'll have to go to <laughs> law, like, <laughs> people need to know what's happening. You need to write the process. I'll tell you, go watch that John Oliver thing. It's like, again, it's a, it's a comedy thing. It, it's enlightening. I mean, I was. Got it. He it's, tackles it's, a lot of topics and goes in depth, showing hu through humor sometimes as yeah, well. Yeah. But like better than some reporters, right? I, I know straight news he, reporters. I do. never heard of this guy. I mean, maybe I live in a rock. So I was like, I never heard of this. He was like, How have you not seen this? And they all sent me this link. It's it's like a twenty minute, fifteen minute video, but it's like it's 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 crazy. But it kind of shows you what, what the system's like. Yeah, and he does it on. I think he does it on HBO, so he's HBO. really like unshackled yeah. in what he can say. Mm. Yeah, HBO. They, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, have a great evening. Thank, thank you. For thank you. Us. Thank, thank you, you so much. We hope to have you back at another alumni association event in the future. Um, if you need to follow us on social media, um, or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, just search CWRU alumni, um, to follow us on any of those platforms. Um, and then to, again, watch throughout the, um, month, um, on our website, CWRU, www.case.edu slash alumni. Um, you can see any of our, you'll be able to view this discussion as well as the other discussions within the film festival as well as any of our other remote offerings. Um, like I said, take advantage. Um, we're here to help and hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to see everybody back <laughs> on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey guys, bye. bye.